Podkit, episode 38, Drop 64-Bit Support, on Sunday, May 20th, 2018. And now, it sounded plausible. This episode of Podkit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Ryan Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersett. This episode has show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk38. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hey. Long time no talk. It's been a while. Yeah. It's been a moment or two, yeah. We just kind of like, oops, skipped, uh, what was last month? Mar- uh, April entirely, but. Happens. You know, there was there was all this extra winter that was going around. Right. Yeah. And I, I was on vacation for 12 of those days. And I was on vacation 12, for April. 12 of the days before that. Yeah. <laughs> so let's blame this on winter and travel. Yeah. yeah. Which is a great thing to blame it on. Yeah. Better than most, most of our other excuses. Well, it's good to be back. And back we are. It is. Uh, which means that uh, as, as, as we record this, it's in the middle middle to late May, which means the next thing on our radars, if you'll pardon the pun, is WWDC, Apple's Worldwide Web Developer, Worldwide Web Developer Conference minus the web. <laughs> uh, that, that would be WWDC. Yeah. What, what would Worldwide W3DC. Developer Conference do? Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so good and so bad all at once um anyhow that's happening on june 4th uh and we are uh you know kind of psyched about it for a number of reasons not the least of which uh being the potential for new hardware please i feel like wwdc is not the place to expect hardware but half the time we get it anyway I and mean, it is like the yeah, I would. I don't know. I don't know what the actual statistics are on what the hardware rate is, but I know. I know we got a um, MacBook Pro refresh one of the years at right. WWDC was in that modern times. Twenty sixteen, I think. I don't know Maybe. when that was. Or last year, I don't remember. I know twenty twelve was the year for because that was the Retina display MacBook right. Pro. Right, so that yeah. was it. WWDC. I, I feel like WWDC is the event to hope against hope for hardware well especially for the hardware that some of us are looking for um because there's there's this intense desire out there right now to replace these awful uh macbook pros yeah the touch bar ones yeah those those touch bar i think it's really the keyboard yeah those keyless those travelless keyboards where the dust one dust particle can have stop any it. of your keyboards been impacted by that or do you even have the right macbooks i have I a remember. wonderful 2013 macbook pro right. that does not suffer from keyboard defects it suffers from age yep mine's basically in the same boat i have i think the the uh h key or maybe the l key on my on my macbook pro i'm not looking at it right now it's starting to wear off uh but i'll take that any day i remember what it is because it's the one that's worn off and also touch <laughs> typing um yeah, yeah. Uh, and as a result i haven't really had to deal with that i also have a magic keyboard which is a much you know it's it's not the same profile but it's much closer than what the what the what my macbook pro has and what i have on my desktop for example but the magic keyboard also hasn't really had any difficulties with the that. magic keyboard 2 is the same age as the butterfly switches but i don't think they actually use the butterfly butterfly yeah. switches yeah that's the one i They're have just a slimmer it's a good choice. Style. Don't use those. Those yeah, the bad. Slimmer scissor button, I think is what they're called, right? Yep. Yeah, I have my 2012 MacBook Pro, which you're listening to me through right now. And you sound great on it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and then at work, I have a 2017 13-inch MacBook Pro with a new keyboard, and I have not had any problems. However, I almost exclusively use my magic keyboard to to type on that so, so. Do, do you also have that um that computer like on a stand or kind of away from where you physically are it is on a desk and i use it as a third screen so i have okay. my two 1080p screens in front of me yep and then below it in the center is my macbook pro that i have email or slack on yep and so it so, gets dusty but it doesn't i don't like eat over it or get grit in it so much Nice. Yeah, so here here in the um, living room, I guess, where I have my new standing desk, um, where I'm sitting right now, not standing, um, <laughs> I have um, I have the MacBook Pro in in this um, stand that I bought on Amazon. Yeah, and um, 
So it's away from me completely physically. Like, it's way over there. Like, here's my hand, and I have to go way over here to get it. Yeah. Because everybody on the audio stream can hear that, right? And mm-hmm. it can, can they can hear your hand move in closer to the camera. Yes, yeah, so that's how it works. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, it's quite a distance away. And so I use this little Bluetooth uh, keyboard I got from Logitech, which is cool because it can switch between inputs. Um, but it's, uh, if I had to get one of these new MacBook Pros, I would, uh, really insist upon using the keyboard entirely, even at work. Right. Because I can't risk having random dust particles decide to get lodged into a butterfly switch. That's just not, not good. Right. That's really, you you don't want your keyboard to be that fragile for sure. For sure. Mm -hmm. I, I have been getting more and more into like messing with my keyboard i'm trying to build a, a mechanical keyboard kit at work um you gotta get the after hours keycap key pullers already got it uh, nice. i've got i've got my keycaps right here uh for those of you listening that is the sound they make for those of you listening for those well, of you see, listening that's way better than what i did with the camera <laughs> well you know uh yes yeah, so that that is the sound of, of keycaps i got uh as part of a group buy that have uh you know uh colors you can't hear um but that's going to be attached to the keyboard that i'm building eventually hopefully maybe we'll see did you say you got that through a group buy did you mean to say groupon group buy yes group buy okay uh, what's that i'll pull it up it's basically uh have you guys ever heard of mass drop yep yeah so yeah it's it's like kickstarter but you aren't trying to make products happen you're trying to make you're trying to unlock special group rates for things. Oh, so you buy stuff in, in bulk kind of a thing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to think of the one that I just bought. I don't even remember the name of it. But it's this one. Good for me. All right. Perfect. Super, super weird out of con- I'm realizing exactly how out of context this is as I paste the link into the topic. That's fine. Um, Nobody will know. Right. It's all good. Um, but uh, those are the keycaps I got. and uh, I like them. They're bold colors. Yeah, exactly. I'm nice. kind of hoping that the, that the result is something kind of fun. But uh, a friend gave me a, a, a different mechanical keyboard that he wasn't... Uh, he didn't want anymore and he wanted to be able to buy another mechanical keyboard so uh i i bought that one from him uh and now that's what i use at my desk it's really it's less clicky but it's more tactile if that makes sense i think it has clears um clear switches which are less they're they're harder to push down but there's less of a um less of a sound associated with it um i have i have the mx cherry clears yeah and they're they're still noisy they are still pretty noisy, <laughs> but maybe less noisy. I don't know. It's the only one I've kn- I've known. So I used to have another keyboard that were blues, I think, and the Ugh. blues were annoyingly loud. Yeah, not to me, but to everybody, everybody around me. Yeah, uh, to I the have. Point, yeah, I have browns on the keyboards that I have here. I don't really use any of those keyboards anymore because I just use my nice little Logitech wireless keyboard thing here. It is. Nice. I will say I'm kind of down the boat of wireless it's, it's just easier i feel like when i get my imac uh-huh. i might just use the i think i'm gonna buy a magic keyboard two with a number pad yeah and just oh it's so long that. you're gonna hate it yeah i don't know we'll see it's like it's like 50 dollars more 30 i don't know if that's worth it or not you get the black one right uh i could but i probably will just get silver oh then you, you're gonna the want the black the one iMac. But it's more expensive. And it's I don't like need twenty dollars it. more. It looks way better. But then it wouldn't match the iMac body itself. Get, get the get a better iMac. Oh, <laughs> whoa! Them's fighting words. I guess <laughs> I don't need an iMac Pro. I don't. You I can just... you can just you can just you know just tape over the screen and just uh, spray paint it. <laughs> spray nice. paint it. I so... wonder if someone's done that. Well, so what else are we hoping for here at this WWDC event? As I just mentioned, I would love an iMac with Coffee Lake, so it has the six core CPUs. I want one of those. And so, so do you, do yep. do you have you seen like an iMac Pro? Like, is the physical body different than a regular the, it's iMac? The same. 
it's the same, same physical footprint. Yep. Mm. Well, hopefully they can, uh, you know, find some uh, space in the iMac to put some real cores in it and not cripple it with mobile cores and mobile chips and mobile this and well, mobile that. Well, traditionally the, de- the desktop has always, at least the upper end desktops have always, or iMacs have always had the desktop class CPU. Yeah, but they haven't had desktop class cooling, which mm. kind of defeats the purpose of having them. Yeah. We'll see. Maybe, I, I mean, I think this iMac's been around a while, so I would imagine it's time for a redesign too. However, they did just release the iMac Pro, so... Well, and it's also hard, I wonder if yeah. it's also hard for Apple to justify putting out six-core iMacs when the iMac Pro totally fulfills the enthusiast lineup. Right. And then they, 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 they might eat into people buying the, I don't know, how much is it, $5,000 iMac uh-huh. Pro? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's been uh, speculation about, um, well, there was spring, springtime speculation for Apple releasing an iPhone SE update. Hmm. That never happened. Yeah. But it would be... Yeah, it seems late now. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see if they would release a different model thing sometime now and then upgrades for the real iPhone X later this year. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I feel like it's not too early to start seeing rumors for the iPhone this fall as well. So maybe they are making some. Maybe it was delayed. Now maybe it's delayed so much that they're just going to wait till the fall. I don't know. Yeah. It would be pretty surprising, I think, to get a different iPhone at this at this point. I'm with you, but... um. Yeah, but I, Apple. But Apple, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, we'll we'll have to see. Do we do we think there's anything else interesting that's possible at WWDC? I'm sure they'll be doing a lot of AR VR stuff. Right. That's I was going to say. That's kind of what I'm most uh, looking forward to: AR VR and Core ML. Um, particularly the stuff around image recognition is going to be really intriguing to me. Yeah. Um, because um, you know I think. We're, we're kind of at the point where like straight up mobile ar uh which was uh you know kind of had us all um had captured all of our imaginations last year is kind of uh at, at a point where people kind of see a little bit more of where it's where it's useful or perhaps maybe that's defined by all the places where it's kind of fizzled out or not really been seen as very useful um like for example does anyone really use the amazon uh, view this product in AR view. I don't really know that 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 one does. But, I don't. I um, didn't even know that was the thing. Oh yeah. So if you if you go to the Amazon app right now, you'll probably f- be able to find pretty quickly a product that you can see in AR. Like with furniture, I think that makes a lot of sense. With like durable stuff, d- durable goods, and that's in. Excuse me. Durable goods in the sense that like, um, they're the things that you uh want to see how they fit in your home and in your like in the place where you are. I think that makes a lot of sense, but like a t-shirt, uh, probably not. Um, yeah. And I, I think, you know, where we're going to be moving towards and like the, the thing that that really exposed is just how, um, how important it's going to be that like vertical plane detection rather than just horizontal plane detection mm-hmm. and, um, you know, image recognition and reacting to um, images as like markers of position and rotation those are going to be really big things in the near future that we're going to just like need in order to push this stuff forward. Didn't Eric at 1.5 get vertical plane support? Right. It's pretty, it's pretty nascent. Um, okay. Still. So like where, yeah, that there's, there are ways that it can be improved for sure. So room um, to grow. Yep. Do you think there'll be Um, any more, uh, opening up of the system? Uh, I think, I think probably so. Like, Core ML, I think, is something that is still also pretty nascent as far as like the the sorts of stuff that developers have access to. Apple open sourced this thing called Turi Create that was like um, a company that they bought a while back built this thing to create models for this you know machine learning engine that they were building, um, and uh, that's basically what Core ML became. Um, or sorry, that eventually became Core ML. Uh, and as a result, 
like there's kind of a little bit of a hackneyed nature to how, how you work with all this stuff like all that's in python and it's like what else you know like um i'm not necessarily going to spin up python a python environment for this purpose because spinning up a python environment can be very painful um it, it, there's there there are ways that this i think can be streamlined and kind of brought better in line with what um the rest of the tool chain and i think part of those two some of those tooling improvements are going to be things that we can hopefully look forward to in some regard that's not to say that it's not like a cool product to recreate is really sweet um it's just kind of um out there in this weird kind of situation um where it doesn't really mesh with the rest of the tool chain but that might just be because i'm not necessarily a um i don't focus entirely on machine learning i uh, and as a result, I don't really want to mess around with Python unless I, uh, uh, unless the developer experience is really worth worth the while, or the end product is really worth the while. Yeah, that's the hard part. And like most of what I'm doing is not really a, uh, the sort of thing where I have massive data sets, um, right? And as a result. Um, like actually building a model from scratch for me is not extremely uh not extremely likely right um right there's a there's a really cool piece i don't know if we ever talked about this about how they built um the not hot dog app for silicon valley using oh absolutely (laughs) uh yes it's a it's a it's a fun thing but like really ultimately it's not using uh like the biggest thing is that it's just you you need a lot of uh you need a lot of stuff and they show you how to get it with ImageNet, but like i don't know it's not um if you don't have a lot of that data and you don't have a a resource for all that data that's high quality it's not going to be a product you're going to enjoy right or you're not going to find it sufficient um, yep. I, I did put a hacker noon post in the in the uh, show notes that talks about um, how they how this person recreated not hot dog um, but like most hacker noon posts it's kind of of dubious quality um, and uh, dubious validity so your mileage may vary well, well at wwdc this year I think to bring it back there unless you have something else to say ryan no i was gonna say your hot dog may vary (laughs) that's you that's you absolutely uh i think other things we could expect i've i've been hearing that the software is just gonna focus more on stability and bug fixing Mm -hmm. that would be Um, really good for apple i think they've been uh made fun of lately for that yeah because there was the leaked memo a few months ago about um not the one about leaking memos but the one about (laughs) focusing more on stability and you know delaying things another year if need be uh i think there was a redesign home screen something i've heard a little bit but i've heard i've seen that might be pushed to 2019 right um what else would i guess in terms of hardware ipad pros are still running the i10 or the a10 chip so they could be updated to the a11s macbook airs maybe apple's got to figure out what they're doing with that line right um drop 64 bit support in in mac os maybe because we got those notices now in oh the 32 bit the... stuff yeah yep. the thing that's like yeah, this say, app yeah. isn't drop 32 bit yeah, I, yeah I don't was... drop 64 bit that's risky <laughs> <laughs> so i don't know i think we'll see we'll see what happens if nothing huge changes it's fine i don't know yeah So I wonder if there will be um, increased privacy and security and, like, data monitoring Mm -hmm. focuses uh, for Apple this year. There's been a lot of um, those kinds of concerns going around, too. Absolutely. Yeah. I think they'll, they'll probably hit us with some other process for keeping user privacy at the front of concerns. Right, uh, and there's kind of the elephant in the room with that is um, like Apple's continued 
involvement in in China and um, kind of how they're handling the relationship with uh, governments that want access to um, cryptographic keys. Um, and I, I know I, I I remember reading a piece about this. I don't have it handy. I'll track it down in the show notes and put it in the show notes at some point. But um, there's some kind of discussion about that as well, which I think just, you know, basically the the end hypothesis, of course, most of this is speculation, um, was that Apple's probably going to just like change, uh, change the way they handle um, device level encryption and storing customer iCloud data, which I think was the particular subject of these concerns. Um, in a way that makes these new requests for essentially backdoors, right? Um, kind of moot, but who knows? I think We're Apple, not there yet. Apple can look into your iCloud information, but they can't on device, right? Right, 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 right. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll see what happens there. Um, I think this is a, a great year for improving Siri yet again. Mm, we'll see <laughs> yeah we'll see it, it has uh, all all of their siri integrations have a long way to go do you think the uh home pod would get a uh focus again at uh wwdc i don't know if they added a bunch of new features to it and made siri a lot better i'd i'd consider buying one but i really haven't yet because it's it's just gonna play music it, it's voice assistant features just aren't that of alexa or the google yep yeah and i'd have to i have to wonder too like there aren't really any home pod developer apis yet and no i i don't really feel like you know i either apple would open up an api for um all siri devices home pod your phone your ipad your mac or basically never open up or not or not open up for the foreseeable future access to developers and that makes it kind of a weird thing i feel like to talk about at wwdc um but not out of the question yeah i also have to see yeah i also just feel like it's kind of a weird uh a, a weird state for voice assistance right now i think it really ended up being a bubble um for sure i totally agree it never really lived up to the hype um you know people were always like oh people are everyone's gonna want uh every every company's gonna want to have an app on these things and everyone's gonna want to use it but i really there's there's a post that i like to refer people to when uh when talking about stuff like this that basically says that people don't really want to use conversational interfaces um and uh and there's there's some weird anthropo anthropological reasons behind it sociological reasons behind it um uh i don't know it's kind of interesting well like to the extent that i don't want to use them if it were like the google duplex demos that were shown a couple weeks ago that would be pretty cool to use i mean it's like talking to a person almost right but on the other hand what we have right now is more like a sort of modern voice-based menu system Right. Where you have right. to know you have to know the magic commands and you need to know the word order and the command order to make it do stuff. Right. Until we can pass the Turing test, I feel like it's just gonna be another interface that you get annoyed with. You have to yeah, remember how to talk to it. Right. And there's no feedback because well, it you generally can't speak while it's saying something to you, where a visual medium you can have visual cues as you're doing something with it. Right. And that kind of begs the question too: Should we ever really want to pass the Turing test with a with a like voice assistant? I feel like the answer is probably no. <laughs> well, well, that we'll see, won't we'll, stop we'll anybody. We'll see in a few decades. Right, 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 right. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I, I still don't. I don't have any smart home, or I should say, uh, smart assistant devices in my in my life. Really, I use Siri exclusively while driving to play music from a playlist or to like maybe rate a song while i'm driving yeah and that's about it maybe to call someone yeah while driving <laughs> i i use siri on the watch a lot but it's mostly just to ask what's the weather mm. what time is it how long yep. do i have before you know my next meeting 
Yep. Not, if I would be amazed if I ever used it for that purpose. I usually ask what time it is or what the weather is or ask it to do something about music. Yep, pretty so much the same. I never use Google Assistant on uh, my phone Yeah, for pretty much anything ever. I, I don't ask it for the weather. I don't ask it for calendar updates. I do use the Google Home, though, to control Chromecast. So you can just ask it to pause and it will do that, which is great because then I don't have to unlock my phone and go to the navigation bar thing and swipe it all over the place to make it pause. Right. It just pauses. Yep. Yep. Nice. All right. So, Brandon, I hear you like Google Hangouts chat. Yes, that's true. So uh, a big thing that I've run into is that um, folks really like to use Google chat, like the kind that shows up in Gmail. And um, the thing that's really annoying about that is that these messages often disappear. And now let, let me tell you, I'm not, I'm not generally a fan of Google products um, or, uh, or Google services. I always find them a little bit grating to use. Uh, if you want more on this, I, I rambled about it at length in the fringe. Um, but uh, the uh, recently I've started moving more of my conversations over to something called Google Hangouts chat, or at least I think that's what it's called. Now let's just been... pause right there. Yeah. And let's get the terminology straight because Google can't handle it, but we can. Wait, so, so it's not called Google Hangouts chat? It is, but nobody knows what you're talking about. So let's, let's just start right. from the beginning sure. of time. Once upon a time, there was a product called Google Talk. Yep. That was basically Google Chat. Yep. Then Google Talk existed, and then they made some other chat services. You know, they made one in Docs. They made one in some other product. And they made eventually Google Plus, which had its own thing. And then they made Hangouts, which is supposed to be a unification of all of their chat experiences. Right. Then they made Allo, which is a failure. Then they made rcs-based uh google messenger or something which is maybe going to roll out someday but don't ask anybody for details right and they decided to deprecate google hangouts for consumers when they made allo but then they realized that businesses actually use it and pay for it in their you know google uh, what is it called now g g suite google apps yeah g suite um they, they pay for it there, and so then they decided to, well, let's just keep that branding for the enterprise version, and we're going to call that the most confusing name ever, Google Hangouts Chat. <laughs> that is such a mess. Now, if yeah. that wasn't bad enough, there's another one called Google Hangouts Meet. Oh, perfect. And, and Google Hangouts Meet is the video calling system that Google Hangouts Chat uses, and Google Hangouts Chat is more similar to Slack and less similar to Google Hangouts, and it is a disaster. The whole it, naming thing. Oh, now, yeah. As a product, yeah. I think it's really good. Absolutely. Um, some things I like about it are that um, you can, whether, whether you access chats from, like, Inbox or Gmail uh, or through the Google Hangouts chat interface, you can still see most of the chats. Uh, you can still see most of the one-on-one -on -one chats. Um, but... You can also build up new group chats in Google Hangouts chat or uh, new rooms, much like Slack, and you get app messages and formatting and uh, all, all the other stuff that I've been personally missing out on a long time. Like, for example, um, sometimes people tune out a group chat because a group chat gets chatty. Surprising. Um, <laughs> but then sometimes something happens and you actually really want to draw somebody's attention to a thing. Uh, you can't do that with any of the old Google Chat things. Um, you have to use uh, the new thing, Google Hangouts Chat, in order to be able to ping somebody about something with an app message. Um, and that alone has been massive for, uh, for, for, for me, I feel like. Um, that said, the naming is still awful, and it's still a, kind of a crappy product that's a part of kind of a crappy product offering. Um, but... So it goes. It's getting better. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Credit where credit is due. And that credit is definitely not applied to naming because it does not have that. Anyhow, Brian, sounds like you were at a hackathon. I still am. What? Yeah, so so um, once a year now, I think for 
four years, my work has done a hackathon called Hackamania, which is like a triple level pun because hackathon is a play on hack and marathon. And then we join in WrestleMania to hackathon. Nice. Hackamania. Um, so this year we, it started Thursday morning. So we had all of work Thursday, Friday to work on our hacks. So these are ideas that people submitted, um, in the last month or so, and then join teams. And I'm working on the same thing I did last year, which is our chatbot, which is a Hubot instance that we call Charlie after the C.H. Robinson founder, Charles Henry Robinson. Nice. And so now with, with year two, me and the other guy who are in charge of it, or not in charge, kind of taking a lead with maintaining it, uh, have been working on building it out to use newer uh hubot 3 which is going to be requiring every script to be its own npm package whoa so we pushed ahead with that format um we're hoping to, to deploy it with docker here I th- it might be all ready i don't i don't know. i don't have access to uh touch it or deploy to it but um so basically for the hackathon this year we had the largest team which is 17 people and we just had a lot of people writing these scripts and then releasing them as packages. So I think we deployed 16 packages to our internal NPM repository. Um, I, I, a couple months ago, I figured out how to do unit testing for a Hubot script and kind of mm-hmm. um, created some standards around all of that. So it's been really fun to just help people add new functionality to our chatbot and write some stuff myself, move over some existing scripts to their own independent package um, and then just kind of play the role as, of a maintainer, which I've quite enjoyed. Nice. And then I wrote a ton of documentation yesterday. I was at work from noon to nine on yesterday, Saturday. I was at work from uh, about 8.45 to 7.45 on Friday and about 8.15 to 8.45 on Thursday. So I've put more than enough hours into this, but it's fun. Um, everyone inside of the IT department gets to use it. And yeah, it's something to, to work on outside of doing straight UI development. Super cool. That sounds awesome. I haven't worked with Hubots directly uh, in a while, but they're always kind of uh, kind of a fun thing to have. So it's cool. I, I want to look into this new architecture more because like having independent npm packages for a lot of things has been really beneficial for me on certain on like react native apps and react apps um it's a i i think it's really cool for sharing functionality but i think it's kind of intriguing that it, it sounds like these would be um the the goal of this is to kind of make it so that if you have a reusable hubot script it's as easy as just running you know yarn add awesome hubot thing what is this a react native module no it's <laughs> that it's, don't yeah. put awesome in the name. Yeah, I get you. I mean, it works quite similar to an internal script, and Hubot two supports third, part, you know, npm packages as well. Um, it's just they have a deprecation warning saying in Hubot three they'll take it away. However, when you install Hubot three point zero point one, it still allows you to do a script directory. But nice, that's something in in their hands. Um, but yeah, it's it's they're quite simple. You just have um, an index.js file that points to your script and loads it in and you just you know call the same it's a function that just is called with the robot object which is the hubot robot instance i think yeah and then you just have a callback in there that responds to um, a regular expression and then you do something with that and you can reply or message or not you can you cannot reply at all and just do something every time any character is sent if you really wanted to but nice yeah, it's fun. I will maybe even do something for the Nexus at our little tiny little team of, what are we, five people, four people? Roughly. Ten people, however many are in our Slack. Nice. Looking forward to it. Good stuff. Yeah. All righty. So do you want an optional story? I've got an optional story. I feel like the optional story is now required. I'm always here for source control stories. Okay. Well, this is a good one. So about a week ago, I I was uh, thinking I should do some node server-side development. 
And we all know how much fun Node development is. You know, you just you just make a JavaScript file and then you start coding away and off it goes. All of a sudden you have an API. How did that happen? Right. And, and maybe you have two endpoints and you have a little kind of service layer and maybe you have a couple of object and model files and, you know, there's probably a dozen files in the end and, you know, it's time to check this thing into source control. Yeah, that makes sense. So, um... My work doesn't use GitHub or Bitbucket directly. They use their own GitHub enterprise yep. uh, source control, which is great. Same here. Because that means we get all the free private repos that we could ever want, which is wonderful. Yep. But that also means I have to have like a billion different SSH keys for all this stuff. So I use the SSH config file Yeah. to uh, maintain all the list of all of the keys and the aliases. So normally when you start a new repo fresh on github but it'll show you that screen that has two blocks of code and you use the bottom one to attach to an existing repo mm -hmm. uh, a, a new remote or use the top one just to initialize it and you know it sets it all up but i can't use either of the blocks i have to type it in myself because i have all these aliases and stuff set up with um ssh config mm -hmm. which is great so I thought, okay, well, I, uh, I'll go to, go make my repo. I'll not copy the script. Okay, I always mess this up, so I'll copy the script, sort of, but then type it in myself. Okay, that worked. It's a miracle. So then I uh, try to do. Uh, I you know I was I was about to hit commit in uh, VS Code, since it's a convenient place to stage all your stuff. And I noticed, huh, it says there's 5,000 things to commit. How did that happen? <laughs> and it's like, oh, of course, node modules. There's a lot of those. Got to make a git ignore. So I, I make a git ignore, and I put node modules and, you know, dot env and a couple of other things just in the git ignore. But then I, I look at VS Code's, you know, little git window and it still says there's 5,000 things to commit and I'm like well why doesn't it why isn't it picking up so I get add and I do some stuff and it's like well I have no idea why it's not picking it up I don't really care it's like one in the morning I want to go to bed so then I thought okay well of course and here here's the problem here's here's where it all falls apart of course get reset hard we'll fix this right mm-hmm <laughs> right that'll fix it right it'll also fix some other things but it'll start with that yeah yeah get yeah, reset totally. hard that will completely wipe everything that you have that's what it does and it was great because i hadn't committed yet i hadn't checked anything in yet nothing it was just it was just gone it's great get reset hard gone wipe it so what what is the lesson we all learned here today make sure you actually have the stuff you're getting resetting hard on somewhere else before you do it for sure. Well, so then I said, oh, it's all gone. So then I thought, well, what are the options of getting the code that I just spent the last three hours working on? Right. Well, I noticed in my terminal window that the node server was still running. Hmm. Um. So, and of course, you know, if, if the code's still running somewhere, that means maybe it's not, like, raw source code files, but maybe there's something to salvage. Maybe I can get... If I could get somehow the node process to print out the functions, mm -hmm. JavaScript functions will print out their source code, sort of, when you ask them to get printed. Yeah. So maybe... I could trick Node somehow, this this two endpoint API, I could trick it into printing itself out. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not, that didn't work. But there is a different way. And this is a pretty cool trick. So there is a thing that has existed in Node. Uh, I think it's called Node Inspector, or yeah. it's called uh, Node Inspect, something like that. And, and, Basically, what this thing does is it is a interrupt that will trigger this inspector thing to turn any node process into debug mode. Mm -hmm. And so you you do a sig user one, I believe, 
as the interrupt on the process. Yep. And it will launch for you a WebSocket for that process that will allow you to give it to VS Code or Chrome or whoever you want to do your debugging. And when you do that, you can get source maps of the code Hello. that were in that node process. And with source maps, I can get all the code I wanted back. Wonderful. Nice. So that was pretty cool. That that was that was your optionally required story about source control and node. So you took uh, the advanced steps of doing debug based uh, version control. I guess so. Uh, yes. let, let me tell you, this is not recommended. So some more details about it in general. So it it worked. I was able to get most of my files back. And so obviously I wasn't able to get back um, anything that the node process wasn't running. So package json wasn't there of course mm-hmm. um you know the env file wasn't there of course you know some of those other things just weren't around um but it's okay like the, even the index file for some reason wasn't in the source maps which huh. is really bizarre that is bizarre yeah um but the eight other files the the two api file or the two routes files the two uh service files and the two I don't know, other things, model files. Those were all intact and fine and in pristine condition, ready for me to copy and paste back into VS Code. Nice. So I'll, 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 I'll file one qualm about VS Code. So I've done this same kind of thing in, um, like, um, those IntelliJ JetBrains products. Right. Where, yeah. where, where you clobber a file on disk. Yep. And then you still have it in your editor. Now it'll put a little star that says, "Hey, this file's changed. Do you want to? What do you want to do?" Yeah. And so for whatever reason, VS Code does not do that. If you make a change to a file on disk, VS Code will immediately pick it back up and show it to you, especially if it's been deleted. <laughs> <laughs> I see. It's funny you mention that because that's the opposite's happened to me. VS Code has, um, I you know, admittedly if a file has been changed on disk that's different than it being deleted um i have had some times when vs code will i'll have an editor open i'll have a file file open in a vs code window i'll delete it and or i'll move it and vs code will still have that record open and save it back in place yeah that, but that can that's happen too. gotta be a different thing it's a different Probably. thing yep it's what a good I... one about in JetBrains IDEs, I'll often update, I'll use the node check or npm check updates package, which I've installed globally to update my package.json with the latest versions of all my dependencies. You're brave. And then I run npmi and have it go to town. And then I open my package.json file and it's still showing the old versions. Hmm. And so I can either hit space, save, and then have WebStorm say, uh, this is different. Do you want to load file system changes or keep what's in JetBrains or in WebStorm? And then I'll just hit load file system changes and then it'll work. Now there is a, a synchronize feature that you can synchronize all your files to disk. And I never remember the shortcut for that. It's probably like shift command S the simplest thing. I should start using that, but on the realm of IDEs and file versions. So the other thing that I'll mention is don't mess up with your get reset hard. Don't do that. You know, when I don't you know st- if I've ever used to get reset hard. When, when you start coding a project, even if you don't think you're going to want it or you're, you think you're going to throw it away, just get in it, make a yep. file, yep. get committed, make a git ignore, just do all the things you should do the first time every time. Yep. I'm sure there's a CLI utility that will print a git ignore for you and stuff. And like worst case, you can always go back in your Git tree and remove any reference to node modules and uncommit all of that. Exactly. Change your tree and then force push it to GitHub. Yeah. So, you know, there were options, but I didn't do them. But you also can't, uh, you know, simultaneously, you, you can't uh, push something that you've Git reset, which is, I guess, the moral of the story. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I run into that a lot too. Sometimes uh, on my personal machine, I'll like sketch something out and I'll start a Git repository for it, but I won't make a corresponding repo on github.com or right. or wherever I want to put it. Um, and that's mostly because I don't really 
mind about most of my personal stuff that I build because most of it doesn't matter and never sees the light of day. But occasionally, I want to pull something from it or demo it to somebody or something like that. And whenever I do, I, I'm always kicking myself when it's not in source control somewhere. Um, even if that's just on my personal machine 10, 20 miles away or whatever. Yep. I, I just So I have a code folder, and then I have a folder for each of the clients that I work at, yep. and then a folder for me. And, like, my folder has, like, a hundred folders in it full right. of repos that I've just tinkered with briefly for, like, an hour. And they're just, you know, all just messy and junky. But they're there. Yep. You can always go back to them. Maybe. I have one. No, I have two Git repositories in Dropbox. Hmm. I have, in my documents folder, I have PyCharm and WebStorm projects. And then an Xcode folder. And I have a bunch of projects in there apparently i have a package lock file in my webstorm projects direct hmm. nice that's not needed um so i'm kind of all over the place at work i just have a github folder and everything is in there in a flat level and it's great wow i think you'd like go i know i know mine my structure is kind of like go to i'll have a code folder and then underneath the code folder uh is a bunch of github username folders and underneath that is where the thing is which is um, really annoying when you want to find something and you can't remember which fork the changes are in, right? So, like, yeah. for example, you have to you have to go between um, the original fork, the one that I made, the one that Space made, or, you know, the one that one of my coworkers made, right, or somebody I know made, um, and all of a sudden I don't really remember which thing has the right thing. So it goes. So it goes. Well, I think it's time for our favorite segment of the show. Yes, new Twitter followers. That's right. I'm very it's been excited. two months, so it's going to be very exciting. We're, we're going to have Brandon begin. He told us in the Fringe, which you can listen to, uh, that he followed approximately 3,000 people in the last two months. Approximately, indeed. That is not entirely true. I think I followed 3,000 people uh, in, uh, in total. I've, but I have followed a fair amount over the past couple months. Uh, oh, so what you're telling me is that that was a joke. That was definitely a joke. Okay. I thought it was true because it sounded pop- plausible. It did sound plausible, and that is why it is such a great joke. <laughs> um, <laughs> speaking of jokes, uh, my first new Twitter followee is Michelle Wolf, who you might remember from her uh, awesome uh, White House Correspondence Dinner uh, monologue uh, way back when, uh, a couple weeks ago. I still um, need to watch it. It is so good. Like, um, if if there's any if there's anyone in comedy right now, uh, that uh is 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 worth watching, it's her stuff. She's got a bunch of stand up specials on Netflix. Just a super funny human being, and also, uh, you know, uh, clearly really um, uh, observant. Uh, you know. Of, of course, some people were upset about her uh, White House Correspondence Dinner thing, but, um, you know, that they were upset kind of indicated that this, uh, that she was in the right, right? That their, yeah, a- their yeah. anger kind of was a self-own. So, uh, <laughs> for lack of a better phrase, uh, speaking of, uh, speaking of cool people, uh, next up is John Ronson, who is a journalist, a uh, writer, uh he wrote the book uh the men who stare at goats if you recall the men who stare at goats from uh what was that 2004 2006 2008 something like that you've talked about it on something yes i love i i really like that book uh the men who stare at goats is all about this like um um uh you know psychological operations kind of situation um i I'm trying to remember um, the movie The Men Who Stare at Goats is dramatized. Uh, and I can't remember whether the... Oh, The Men Who Stare at Goats, the book, is nonfiction. Uh, but the movie is dramatized. So um, the thing I... you know I remember a lot of really weird things about the book. Um, basically talking about... Um, uh you know the the u.s army's um exploration of like new agey um you know paranormal sort of uh techniques in in warfare 
and um i don't know i i, I find that stuff super fascinating um so it's definitely worth a shot also uh he collaborated with the uh director of snowpiercer on a show for netflix called um uh okja which i think is pronounced okia i haven't watched it yet but i've heard that it's very very good um so it's worth it's worth a shot for he is a cool person and does cool things uh last but not least this one's actually about technology uh whoa yeah is react native radio (laughs) i know i picked two out of three of my twitter followers because um they they had nothing to do with work um which is kind of fun uh but last but not least is react native radio uh a podcast focusing on react native um admittedly i've i've only watched uh a couple a couple episodes because uh it's uh you know i just kind of joined in a little bit uh, a little bit ago um but they capture a lot of really interesting stuff uh about react native and kind of where it's going so it's also uh worth keeping an eye on that's pretty cool i think i follow the guy who has been yeah tweeting this or something i don't know how twitter works the guy behind it uh nader nader that guy yeah yeah nader yeah i think i follow him or something yeah i've had some interaction with him on twitter totally he seems chill and it has something to do with react native so that's why yep yep truly truly how about you brian i have followed maybe like uh six people since we last recorded which is pretty good also means i unfollowed roughly that many so the first person is Aaron Cannon. Um, he spoke at JavaScript Minnesota in April, right? Yeah. April. Um, so yeah, he's the co-founder and chief accessibility engineer at Accessible 360. He and the CFO of Access, uh, no, C, uh, CTO. Was it? Yeah. CTO. Thank you. At Accessible 360 did a great talk about um, accessible web design. And uh, it was super cool to watch and learn about and he has twitter and you should follow him yay um next is lemon or uh it's he's, he spells it backwards right now so it's what like not even backwards like inverted yeah <laughs> yep upside Those down and backwards you can't yeah, yeah. I, I, um, that's unpronounceable yeah <laughs> yeah i don't even know yeah lemon he did a talk at PubConf Minneapolis a couple of weeks ago, which I went to, which is awesome. You should go next year. And he had a good talk. He had a great stage presence. And I don't know anything else about him, but he's a local tech person. Truly he and is. And finally, uh, Isaac Halverson, who goes by the name Isaac, which is a play on like the name Isaac that I've always thought about for years and years. And so I'm... I'm amazed that I know a Twitter user who has the name Isaac. I don't know. I'm happy about that. Yeah, he works at awesome. Robinson. Uh, he's, uh, I think he's an iOS developer on the carrier and mobile, or the yeah the mobile apps. And we're on the engineering blog committee together. So hopefully we could talk about that next podcast. Sweet. Maybe a public Robinson IT presence. Whoop whoop. It's pretty yeah. cool to have a public IT presence. <laughs> we're getting there what about okay. you Ryan I followed some people so let's see here in order I follow not Brent or Brent I don't know who it is it's not Brent though yeah um, good dogs and, and so Brent um, works in Canada in Vancouver on Expo and Expo is the I don't, I don't know what you'd call it like middleware sort of platform that we build our react native apps on yeah and he's a really cool guy he i think he's one of the i don't know i feel like he's one of the team leads there because he's all over the github issues and uh forums but maybe he isn't i don't know but he uh posts tons of stuff about react native which is great because i read it awesome yeah i immediately followed him for uh for the same reasons um that's good stuff i'm always trying to keep an eye on what's going on with react native and then i have here a person called jared palmer who allegedly is the lead engineer at the palmer group which is probably his own business which Mm -hmm. is pretty funny to have in your profile um but he also works on react stuff of course imagine that right 
Um, specifically, I believe he worked on Formic, which is sort of a good form validation tool thing for React. Sort of, sort of indeed, yeah. Um, it's probably better than most of, if not any of the others. Totally. Um, for general use cases, at least. Uh, he also has done some other work, like on React FNs, which are pretty cool wrappers around um, br- advanced browser functionality, but in React component form, which is always fun to see. Mm-hmm. So that's who I followed lately. Very, very exciting two-person list. Hey, that's all right. That's awesome. It's longer than sometimes. <laughs> yep. So good. Well, I think that is our show for this uh, for this month. <laughs> you're too hey. you're you're too literal. Too literal. No, too literal? You're, you're 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 spot on actually. Uh well, well, let's let's walk that back a little bit. Let's say that's our show this time. Um, okay. Thanks for joining us, friends. Uh, next time, which may or may not be in a month. Uh. We'll, we'll be back and it we'll will talk be about... let's have some confidence it will be it's not weekly anymore it's not weekly Remember that summer i mean we're gonna have to do it next month because of WWDC. wwdc we have no choice oh yeah we're gonna we're gonna be we're gonna be with you guys again in what two three weeks with WWDC. we're, we're, we're gonna we're, we're gonna have to do a nexus special and then yep. right after we're gonna have to do one of these pod kits not react kits yep and it's gonna be great let's talk about all the pods and our reactions to them. So in that yes. sense, it will just be a and different any kind new of kit podcast. that Apple makes. And we're going to have to be really swift about those shows. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so well, we'll be swift because we'll be reacting natively. Well, we're um, going to have to see our objective and yeah, get it done. I was, was going to say that one. Uh, geez, I need a cup of Java in order to make this uh, to make sense. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, uh, that was awesome. I uh, so I where, where where can we find you on the internet, Ryan? Well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on Twitter and Ryan Mar, unless Twitter decides to l- delete itself from existence. <sighs> and then we just can't find you anywhere. Nope. <laughs> oh, no. How about you, Brian? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Brian Mitch L. And I made up my mind, if third-party apps go down the toilet, I think I'll just transition and use the first-party Twitter app. No, you got to stand strong with the rest of us and abandon ship. Yeah, we'll see. Maybe it's time to check out micro.blog. Maybe. I've heard that's a thing. Yeah. I also have a website, brianm.me. I haven't done anything with it in too much recent time. Wait, no, I did. I added Strava. You can find me on Strava now. hey On my link on the front page. What about you, Brandon? You can find me uh, on Twitter where my username is Brandon underscore MN. Uh, my username is Brandon underscore MN at most places. So if you want to find me on places like Instagram or Strava, um, that is also my name there. Uh, if you want to get to my website, replace the underscore with a dot, and you have Brandon dot mn, and that is the place where web things happen. I recently updated it with slides from my mini webcom talk, uh, which is about getting uh, started with AR and mobile AR frameworks. Uh, if you want to talk about that stuff, uh, contact info for me is also over there. If Twitter goes under, uh, you will not find me on Twitter at Brandon underscore mn, but I'll probably post a bunch more pictures of bread. Uh, with weird captions on Instagram for that is what I do. Awesome. All right. And of course you can find this episode uh, somewhere at the nexus.tv slash PK 38. And you know, as an aside, there's something about this Patreon thing that we're supposed to talk about, but we'll do that in post. Yep. So don't worry. You won't, you won't even have heard what Ryan said. I'm going to exactly. be so thorough about post-production. Exactly. But if that doesn't happen, you'll know that there's something about it, just in case. It definitely it does exists. Exist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Which good. you can find at patreon.com slash the Nexus TV. There's no dot. Just all one word. Sweet. I think that's it. All right. See you all next time. Have a good one. See you later. <laughs>